Hey, BDE fans, and a first for BDE. I don't think we've done BDE remotely yet, have we? We have. Oh, yeah, that's right. When we had the Russian expert on, we did that. We also did one. I was in Nashville, I believe. It was a early last summer, I think. Yeah, and we tried to have Kirk calling in from uh, from Nantucket through the years. The uh, One of my favorite... Uh, text that I've ever gotten in my life is uh, Kermit one time was watching a webinar and John was hosting a very distinguished professor of some sort and they had the Chuck Yates poster behind him and he just goes what is that professor thinking he's sitting there looking at it so anyway so how's so you're punching out the house almost done yeah yeah I'm, I'm playing a little uh General contractor, supervisor, tool pusher, company man, however you want to analogize it. But uh, yeah, so lots of interesting stuff to talk about. And guess what? what? We're not starting. We're not starting with oil. In fact, yeah, let's not. It's not even. With oil. It's not even on the run of show. It's not on the run of show. So oil, let's oil jump is in. firmly in firmly in tedious territory. So All right, let's jump in. Three Mile Island. Let's yeah, see. Yeah. I saw a piece last week. We've talked about the the agreement that Microsoft has with uh, Constellation to really rehab and restart one of the units at, at Three Mile Island for a data center uh, power supply agreement. And what caught my eye in this update was one, just the extent of what is going to have to happen before they start to load fuel in. Um, there's a tremendous amount, you know, one of the things was I, they, they've got just all kinds of scaffolding that they've got to, uh, choreograph and, 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 and do things. I mean, it's almost specialists. like it was stripped. I mean, it almost felt like the vacant building in downtown Detroit, you know, that I mean, you got stripped you got, to nothing. You got plants and trees growing up in the, uh, in the old, uh, cooling tower and redwood foundation elements that have to be replaced with more modern materials. And one of the interesting things to me, but it makes perfect sense, is that the core of the control room, which is all analog, they're going to leave, I'm sure, with some repair and, and upgrade, but it's going to remain analog because it keeps it more insulated from uh, cyber attacks, which is pretty interesting. So we've got something that is going to power a next generation data center and AI being ultimately controlled and powered by something that's, you know, old dials and levers. Well, you know, there's probably an element of the the Southwest cockpit, you know, because all their 737s, they keep standardized because right. all their pilots forever have been flying on that cockpit. And so they leave the same. So I wonder if there's an element of that to it, too. But the, the, the most interesting I, I guess thing to watch uh, tomorrow is the first of the NRC's uh, public comment hearings. I'm not sure exactly what time that is, but if I can find a streaming, um, certainly be worth paying attention to because that you know that is the parallel element here in terms of the timeline. Um, the refurbishment is really just on a four year timeline before they get everything put back together and and upgraded and ready for uh, loading fuel. And that ticket is $1.6 billion. There was a quote from an unaffiliated, or at least the affiliation of the activist group was not named, but he had said that he had witnessed the 79 incident um, and you know that there was going to be quite a bit of um, in his words, a protracted, you know, get ready for a protract, protracted and long battle. So I expect he will be speaking at tomorrow's hearing. Uh, it, it's so. going to be in, it's going to be interesting because if you think of the players here, we'll see who the administration's going to be, who they're dealing with. Um, but you've got a Democratic governor in uh, in Shapiro. You've got obviously the environmentalists that are the big constituency of the of the Democratic Party. And then you got big tech, who's historically been very pro-democratic. Maybe there's some cracks this time where you see 
folks like Musk and others supporting Republicans. It's going to be fascinating to watch because if if you look in the crystal ball, I think you wind up seeing a backroom deal here that kind of rivals the COVID vaccine in terms of what actually happens in terms of pushing this through with speed. And it wouldn't surprise me if at the end of the day, and I hope this doesn't happen, but do we use the National Guard on protesters out there? Because this is this is going to be as high a profile thing as we've seen. And so it'll it'll really set the tone for what happens here. It, it, it's certain, certainly going to be a good first test of the thesis that big tech is going to make it happen no matter what because of their political affinity. Uh, you know, if this were being led by traditional old line industrials or oil and gas, God forbid, then that's a different, um, I guess, sentiment and political dynamic. You know, the the four year rehab uh, probably take the over on that um, for a lot of reasons. I mean, the facility had the incident 45 years ago. In fact, the reactor that had the partial meltdown in 1979 is still 45 years later, apparently undergoing uh, ongoing uh, decommissioning activities, which surprised me a little bit. But that's uh that was kind of quite telling. I I think the NRC um, whole, you know, we've talked about it before too. Let's let let's see how much of the inertia that has been part and parcel over the last forty to fifty years of trying to get anything done on time and on budget related to building new nuclear in the U.S. Let's see if that is a catalyst for really changing that. And I, you know, I I do think that um, what happens on November fifth is going to be at least. Um, an indication of of just just where this might go. Um, I think I, th- I think one subtle point in the press release that I noticed that's kind of part of it is they are changing the name. It will no longer be known as Three Mile Island. It'll be Crane Energy Plaza or something to the effect. The uh, the former CEO of Constellation. So the yeah, uh, the, my, my the first thought was has it, started. My first thought was that it is it. Jim Crane, but he's kind of busy with other other things. <laughs> that he is. All right. So I did not listen to the Veriton podcast with Peter Lake. So kind of give me the give me the the one oh one on it, because from your email it sounded like it was pretty good. Yeah, the um the headline and and I'm paraphrasing, I'm sure, or the title was um without power nothing matters. And so Peter Lake, who is now in private practice as a consultant with his firm as Cardinal Rose, Peter Lake at the time of URI was chairman of the Texas Water Development Board. And so when the whole debacle that unfolded in the midst of URI with ERCOT, PUCT, Texas legislature, you know, the tragedy that was URI, uh, particularly in in the cost of human lives. And uh, he did uh, clarify something that you've talked about before, that we were within a very short time timeline of a total grid collapse. And I think I recall he said it was like four minutes and 37 seconds, which had that happened, um, best case is that you would have had the entire state or the entire grid literally without power for a number of weeks and probably longer. And so the the domino effect, the direct effect on, you know, Texas ratepayers and and power consumers would have been catastrophic, but Texas is the seventh largest economy in the world. And if you think of the connections, uh, particularly from the energy and petrochemical complex without power, you're not running pumps, you're not running thermal units, you're not running processors, and certainly can't fill up vehicles, uh, not to mention the, um, Kind of life and death aspects of of power support itself and healthcare, et cetera. Um, it was really close to a catastrophe. But the main, I think, the main theme or the main um, uh, outcome was, you know, Peter is a guy who walked into this, appointed by Governor Abbott, and had to be convinced multiple times. Said, "Look, I don't have any." 
I have zero power or subject matter expertise. And what the governor recognized right in the middle of that crisis is I've got to have some somebody with completely fresh and unbiased eyes um, take the lead here. And essentially what it what the effort did was align three really historically misaligned and kind of cross-threaded constituents, that being the Public Utility Commission of Texas. And he took on the role of chairman of the PUCT in that role. He also took a board seat on ERCOT and the legislature got in line. And so kind of the bottom line is here, um, the build out and the expansion of the grid, particularly as it relates to generation, had been characterized, the objectives have been characterized or priorities have been characterized in the acronym CARE, which is clean first, affordable second, reliable third, energy, and totally flipped it, uh, flipped it around to race. Reliability is, if not singular, it is immovable as a first priority. And so you got the legislature, ERCOT, and uh, the PUCT quickly and completely aligned. And so the legislature in particular got moving very quickly on funding many things that had been bogged down. He talked about one transmission line that had been stalled for a number of years from the Rio Grande Valley, you know, to get uh, to get some renewable power up to San Antonio. And really the reliability, the subordination of reliability as we built out in a in in a pretty rapid acceleration or addition of renewables on the grid, um, we, we, we got through the crisis and it was a wake up call to say, you know, we've got to make sure that grid stability and grid, grid reliability are paramount because nothing else matters beyond that. And you've, you've got to be designed for that. Um, there's a lot ahead of uh, the PUCT and ERCOT with respect to the things that we've been talking about. And, you know, we start adding uh, demand pressure on the grid, which is nowhere near optimized, but it's in much, much better shape. Um, we, we haven't come close to that. Um, the grid collapse scenario that we saw in URI. But at the same time, when you're talking about adding the magnitude of the slugs of demand over the over a short period of time related to high performance computing and AI, you know there there are things that are going to come up in uh, peak load situations. Um, Peter talked about you know the demand response uh, post URI um, had been pretty good. So ERCOT sends out these conservation notices and they, they've gotten pretty good demand response. However, he cited one from, I believe the summer of 22 where two conservation notices went out in the same week. In the first one, they had great response and never got close to having, you know, a, a rolling, uh, blackout situation or a, a load shed situation. But they got a second one in that same week, and the de demand response was virtually zero, as he described it. So as we think about adding um, this type of demand that is coming at us pretty quickly from high-performance computing and AI, the conflicts of interest on the grid between residential uh, and commercial, interruptible power, and large flexible load are going to be really interesting to see. So if it starts happening frequently because the grid has not been optimized, you know, and we continue to to outrun our storage capability with respect to adding uh, renewable generation or non-dispatchable generation, you know, how is that all going to going to play out? So there's a lot more kind of base load pressure that's coming that is going to make things, you know, really really tight in um, in the peak demand or crisis type of situations. But ERCOT is in much, much better shape. The PUCT is in much, much better shape. And what I also found stunning is that he said he's gotten no inbounds from all the other regional grids. And, you know, Texas got its act together very quickly in response to a crisis. But the, you know, kind of the model or the lessons learned have not 
not really been adopted or adapted outside. Yeah, because I, I mean, you and I talk about this all the time. ERCOT, for you know, all its problems and stuff, is really just truly a leading indicator. You know, it's it's going to go through it, and everybody else is going to go through it as as well. The one thing I will say that I'm mildly encouraged by since the last time we've really talked a lot about ERCOT is I had Neil Dykeman on Chuck Yates Needs a Job, and we talked a lot about solar, but we also talked grid technology, and it kind of harkened me back to the late 90s when oil fell to $12 a barrel, and I went from being an oil and gas banker to a power technology banker, and I was basically running around finding anything having to do with hydrocarbons and the internet, and there was a lot of cool stuff back there particularly software-wise, we at Stevens invested in a company called Silicon Energy. And I really thought that was going to be the biggest company on the planet. It was an energy management software, basically lets you do a lot of cool stuff. One of the great use cases is Neiman Marcus bought it, and they actually figured out if you pumped oxygen into the store, sales went up 5%. You know, and so anyway... And what it was interesting talking to Neil because Neil said a lot of the technology that, you know, I liked in in, uh, Silicon Energy, he said, we're doing it now. Finally, it's taken 25 years later, but we're we're finally getting there. So if you had a progressive ERCOP board that respected kind of science, but at the same time was willing to push, I think there are a lot of cool things you could do with the grid. Uh, today, I think it's a cultural and mind shift issue. So that's why when you sent that email, I'm, I'm going to go back and listen to this because it would be cool if if ERCOT could be kind of a, a leader on this front. Yeah. And, you know, the the other I think the other principle or philosophy is we need to let the markets work in terms of the right um distribution of, of generation resources, um, you know, pointed to the fact that Texas sits on, quote unquote, an ocean of natural gas, for example. Nuclear is obviously, you know, um, in the mindset, but he did say, look, and my characterization is you kind of run up to the moat of the NRC at the federal level and there's just you know, there, there's no ability, I think, to affect the type of sweeping change that we've been talking about at the NRC that's going to have to come, you know, politically and from the federal level. Um, but it's clearly a um, uh, a much more progressive mindset and a much more balanced mindset. Um, you know, great job of getting um, the three constituents uh, fully aligned or as, as fully aligned as they've ever been over the last 15 to 20 years. You know, now I think there are two of the PUCT that sit on the ERCOT board. And so, um, you know, the, 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 these are not trivial decisions that the Texas legislature, for example, has to make in terms of funding, uh, major grid additions like that AEP, AEP line that I talked about coming from uh, the Rio Grande Valley up to San Antonio. Well, when Bill White became mayor of Houston, the first thing he did was get the street guys, the telecommunication guys, the water and sewage guys all in one room. And he said, hey, guys, overlay your plans, because when we tear up the street, we're doing it once. And you got to go in and fix the pipes and the telecommunication and the cable lines and all that. Because Houston used to be a muck with, they'd tear it up to fix a, a water line and then six months later have to tear it up to do a telecommunications line, et cetera. So it sounds like there's some of that thinking. Was this Maynard chatting yeah, with well, him? It was mainly and, cool. and a couple of others on the Veritin team. And I, I'm sure I didn't do it near justice. It, it, it is worth an hour of your time to, uh, to listen cool. and watch so, uh, this particular podcast. So is Peter we'll, Lake. We'll provide the link. Uh, Peter Lake. Yeah. All right. So what are the uh, what are the numb nuts doing with BRICS? <laughs> well, there's a uh, BRICS summit. I don't know if that's the official term that's going on this week in Kazan, Russia. And 
you know, a couple of things. I, I didn't realize that, you know, BRICS had now grown to 10 countries uh, beyond the Brazil, Russia, India, and South Africa. You've added f- five more, Egypt, Ethiopia, Iran, Saudi, and UAE. And really the message has been we're looking to basically provide an alternative to the West in terms of world leadership. And I, th- I, 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 I concluded from all this is that in, in um, China, Chinese President Xi made some, I guess, thinly veiled, but pretty pointed if you read between the lines comments about um, the global South. And I think as far as Russia and China are concerned, uh, particularly China, looking at what we're doing in the West, which for a number of years has been fairly climate distracted, and the things that we're doing that, you know, you have to step back and take a look. Okay, what are we really doing to our energy and supply chain security, for example? Um, We just talked about ERCOT and some of the, you know, ready aim, uh, ready fire aim type of decisions that we've made in terms of adding generation. But, you know, clearly looking uh, to attract a a large portion of the unaffiliated with the West in terms of leadership group of the global South. And I also think it has a bit more of a a self-interested or a selfish motivation, because if you look at the global South, there's a lot of raw material resource there. Not that China doesn't already have um, a pretty significant, if not dominant, um, control position of both raw materials and processed uh, materials. Um, the the notion that you know India, for example, has got uh, an increased alternative to having to conform to things like um, we talked about it recently. India of pushing to join the IEA, for example. And the IEA, as we know, has been very much split into two factions. One is its historical um, energy data and policy and and, uh, global analysis in that regard, but has also become much more of an advocacy group for uh, renewables and net zero. And so India's got a much more difficult balancing act if it's going to go Kind of the alignment with the West is the way I look at it, and what what BRICS is saying, um, you know, our, our priorities are our own security, our, our own well being, our own access to to energy and raw materials, and, and so um, we're over here in the West distracted by a lot of things related to um, ESG and climate, and I, I just think it's a bit of a power play um, that they're that they're indicating to, to change, you know, to change the leadership a, a bit more from what it's historically been Western powers to uh, this new, new BRICS alliance. And I mean, given, given our Navy, I, uh, I don't think at the end of the day, they're going to get a lot of traction with this. I, I kind of see the more dangerous thing, say what you want about Richard Nixon. I mean, about as shrewd a person as we've had in world affairs. And he was always big on you got to play China and Russia off each other. You can't let those two collaborate. And so the worrisome, the worrisome thing here, it, at least from my point of view, is you've got Russia and China working together. You've got North Korea now collaborating with the the Russians and potentially sending troops into into Ukraine. I mean, allowing our enemies to all come together and work together is not going to be good, even if it's kind of a a uh, what I think is ultimately going to be kind of an ill fated uh, alliance of bricks. But um, yeah. No, we uh, we definitely don't want those guys getting along. Yeah, and you know, kind of the subplot or the a theme that we just talked about with ERCOT, the crisis brought about a, a a rapid reprioritization of the thing that really matters, which is reliability and 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 access and affordability. I, I think that from just a 
higher economic view is is really what this is about because you've got countries migrating to that that alliance that is more eastern led more led by authoritarian superpowers that um you know provides a much less confused um policy making landscape that's not encumbered by things that we've chosen to make front and center in the way we think of banking policy, namely, um, namely net zero and climate. Yeah. No, it'll, uh, the, cause I mean, and, 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 and I got to believe cynically that they're happy to see us continue to be distracted by that in the West. Yeah. Cause I mean, the one thing I do think we need to be planning for and thoughtful for as much of a problem as he is, Putin's old and rumors have, been out about his health and and all so there will be a in in our lifetime there will be a post putin russia uh sooner rather than later and i need to we need to at least be thinking of that of that chessboard yeah i on, think he's on that happening see a couple of years past average russian male life expectancy yeah i mean he's 70s right yeah he's early 70s yeah, and uh, I mean rumors that uh, rumors that he had you know some sort of cancer or something. So Putin is ah uh, where is he? He was born in uh, he was born in fifty two. So what's that? That's so he's at least well seventy two. Seventy two. So yeah. It's been the longest serving Russian leader since uh, Joseph Stalin. So, all righty. Um, the uh, so let's let's close it down with the uh, the Doomberg piece. I thought uh, and, I thought and it this was is really related. Good. Yeah, very much related. Why don't, why don't you kick us off here? So Doomberg wrote a piece um, talking about Taiwan. And as we all know, uh, two thirds of the world's semiconductors, 90% of the really advanced ones are made in Taiwan. That's why it's so important. Uh, at one point in their history, I believe half of all their electricity was generated by nuclear. Political elements have come in and, and they've shut, in effect, have moved to shut down nuclear power in, in, uh, in Taiwan. And so they're kind of faced with needing hydrocarbons. They don't have the Permian Basin sitting on the island uh, anywhere. And so, you know, they're importing natural gas and coal to make this happen. And that just makes them incredibly vulnerable, right? Because uh, China, China doesn't have to invade. China can literally just not let the tankers show up with coal and or LNG and and starve the island uh starve the island out and so it's uh it's interesting reading through cuz that's you know you look at future pressure points in the world and clearly Taiwan is going to be one of those every indication out of Z and China is we want it back so uh it's interesting watching how energy is playing a major role in there and the desire to get rid of nukes on a political front is really just putting that, those guys in a bad spot when it comes to their enemy. I mean, they're on a really steep downward slope of decommissioning uh, of their nuclear facilities, and they're now kind of 91% dependent from a power generation standpoint on coal and natural gas. And just to scope it here, on the natural gas side, they import the equivalent of or consume the equivalent of 2.65 BCF a day. And so um, it, it's not a trivial thing for a heavily import dependent uh, country like Taiwan, an island country. One, one of the uh, kind of eyebrow raising elements of the whole thing is this notion at the energy ministry level of offshoring power generation to places like the Philippines and Japan and running a submarine cable back to Taiwan, a high voltage series of cables, I guess, 
Um, the, I, I, I just did a little chat GPT playing around after I read the piece, you know, what's the longest high voltage submarine line in the world? It's one that came online back in 22, 23 between Denmark and the UK. It's called the Viking link. And it's about a 1.4 gigawatt submarine line. Some of it is, you know, on surface. I don't know exactly, but that, that line is just under 500 miles, 475 miles long. So I did further kind of gee whiz on, okay, let's say we put the power in Japan at the southernmost tip of, of the main island and to Taipei City, which is on the north northern tip of Taiwan, you're looking at over 700 miles. And if you did the same type of, of configuration with the northernmost part of the Philippines to the southernmost um, metropolitan area or industrial area in, in on Taiwan, it's well over 300 miles. And the other aspect of that is you've got a, a subsurface or an ocean floor that is certainly in an area that's a lot more tectonically active and is, I would say, um, witness to a lot more activity and presence from navies like the Chinese Navy, the North Korean Navy, and even the Russian Navy. And so <clears throat> this this offshoring or let let's let's push the the generation to other countries and pull it back seems very much like you know what we have tried to do with you know with some of our emissions accounting. And it got me to thinking, uh, given their criticality uh, as supplier of the world's semiconductors, are there customers, you know, have, have they put some kind of pressure on them to at least have the optics of net zero, with, which then lead to actual changes in the energy system that make it, in, in my view, a lot more vulnerable? Because we know that the Chinese Navy, for example, has had very active exercises in the Straits and is is demonstrating by example their ability to effectively blockade. And the other thought around that is if you did have high voltage cables, is there, you know, could you could you mess with those? Yeah. This has been really interesting for my political take. I mean, I grew up Reagan's America, free trade is a great thing, um, and all. And you know, you go through a pandemic where you can't get toilet paper. And you realize, okay, we do need some manufacturing capability. This is that on this is that on steroids, right? This is this is huge. Ninety percent of our advanced chips are there. I mean, we need to be building uh, building chips in the United States where they're secure within our borders. And then again, lesson be learned for us on on energy policy. I mean, we're blessed with so many resources here, but if we unilaterally decide to just not u- not use them, then oops, we could be uh, be at the uh, the whims of our enemies. So, yeah, I mean, it's you know, it's just it's it's risk concentr- concentration in a critical element of all we've been talking about in terms of technology advancement. HPC and AI, the semiconductor, part of that will semiconductors are used in much, much beyond that. But to have two thirds of the world's supply of the base semiconductor concentrated in an increasingly vulnerable um, uh, literal island, and then compounded by the fact that you are essentially pursuing a path that looks a lot like Europe's, particularly Germany's and the UK's by, you know, worrying or placing a priority on your carbon accounting over energy security and and availability because they have, you know, the grid has gotten much, much more stressed in the last couple of years. They've had um, a much higher frequency of of grid incidents and and brownouts, blackouts uh, with more impact, more widespread impact. So if you continue to take down your baseload, reliable, clean power in the form of nuclear, it, it, I think it stands to reason that there's there's going to be more of that um, 
more more of that telltale within uh, the grid because I, I I don't believe that global semiconductor demand, particularly for the more complex stuff, which again they control or produce ninety percent of that, the the higher uh, more sophisticated use. Um, the the de-risking of building manufacturing capability in the U.S. will proceed on an evolutionary scale. But what if something happens on more of a revolutionary timeline? I don't know what that looks like. I, you know, there, there's a lot of geo, geopolitical analysis that I'm not qualified to uh, to do or comment on. But I, it, it was just a very thought provoking piece and a very important part important part of the world supply chain with a lot of of a uh, very um, concerning political dynamics uh, when, quite frankly, the world has has placed most of its attention and, and deservedly so on, you know, what's going on in the Middle East and, and the Ukraine. But I just thought it was a, a bit of a wake up to, hey, there's, you know, there's, there's a growing situation in Taiwan and Taiwan's pretty important uh, to the global yeah. economy. Yeah, and it's definitely going to be an issue that whoever the next president of the United States is, is dealing with on a real time basis. So, yep. Well, what's the World Series prediction? I saw I hope they a, both uh, lose. I saw, yeah, I saw, to that point, I saw a meme of the U.S. map, and it said World Series um, fans, or you know, which, which 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 team do you want to win the World Series? And there was one concentrated blue or red for the Yankees on the East Coast. I think it was literally just the state of New York. And in Southern California, it was just the LA area, the LA Dodgers. <laughs> and then they had a then they had a, a caricature of, you know, send the meteor. <laughs> right. And that was the rest. The uh, So maybe, you know, we haven't done a finger in the week, but maybe we'll give the finger of the week to uh, Brian Cashman for going on. I forget whose podcast he went on or what TV interview he went on. And all he did was gripe about the Astros and cheating. And, you know, so give me I'll a take break, the opportunity Cashman. to revisit the fact that the letter that they um, had pried from their cold dead hands that the commissioner issued on September the 14th of 2017 that was kept under lock and key for a very long time. So for all of 2015 and half of 2016 seasons, they were found in quote unquote material violation of using uh, video replay and technology to relay signs in real time. And at that time, you know, before anything broke in 2019, at that time, a six-figure fine of the sport's most valuable and most uh, famous or notorious franchise, you know, it, 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 the Yankees and a handful of other national franchises are the Golden Goose. You know, keeping that under wraps, I, I can tell you, had they been, had that been uh, public at the time that that all came down. And it, it really syncs up well with Carlos Beltran coming over to the Astros and saying, in terms of this whole system, you guys are you guys are behind the league, behind the times. Right. And so shades of gray of whether, you know, the severity of it, um, but the the kind of the self righteousness of of Cashman, which has been pretty consistent out of him, is is amusing, that, if if not that, aggravating. That being said, I do have a great Brian Cashman story that I love. So he started off as an accountant for the Yankees, right? I mean, he's an entry-level accountant. And he notices that Ricky Henderson has not cashed a bonus check. I think it was a $100,000 bonus check, six months old. So he tracks Ricky down. And he's like, hey, Ricky, I noticed you haven't cashed that check yet. Did you lose it? Do we need to cut you another check? And Ricky said, Brian, I'm just waiting for interest rates to go up. <laughs> That's good. Well, good luck I'm, with I'm, the house. I'm glad, you, I'm glad you brought out the finger of the week. So, yeah, it, it's, there we it's, go. going, it's going fine. We got everything lined up. All right. Cool. Get the house done. Uh, we'll see you next week.